you know, the, the topic of women in tech, I feel like, gets talked about all the time. I'm sure all of you are asked to talk about it all the time. Um, and yet the challenges remain. And it's not just, it often gets boiled down to hiring more women. And it's so much more than that. Um, so over the next hour, I just want to foreshadow a little bit of some of the topics we want to get into, including um, how companies go about hiring, how they go about setting their culture, how they go about retaining people, um, not just about women, but also diverse groups of women, non-binary people, uh, LGBTQ people, um, uh, people of color, all of those issues. Um, and then what does it look like? What is the impact on companies basically when they don't have that, which is the status quo for most of the companies. Uh, what I've asked each of the panelists to do is introduce themselves and also a little bit about where they come at this conversation. Um, I don't like like big bios, you can read them all, but um, I do think it's helpful to know where everyone um, kind of comes at this. So I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves and then we'll go from there. Natalia, do you wanna start? Sure, so why is there a gender glitch? Check out the room. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm a cis queer Latina. My gender pronouns are she, her. And oftentimes, how many times are women and femmes often we have to deal with all guy panels? And we don't really see the, the reverse. So I just, I want to call out what is there and I want to just name it because it's important to name things. I, um, I launched Pipeline Angels. How many of you watch Shark Tank? Are you familiar with Shark Tank? I like to say I'm in the business of creating more women and femme sharks. <laughs> and um, in 2012, there was a very well-known white guy investor. I won't name drop. Yes, I will. Paul Graham. Um, <laughs> and he um, was interviewed at a tech conference, and he was asked, what do you look for when you invest? And he very nonchalantly said, someone like me. Bless you, and I'll just repeat it just in case you missed it. <laughs> Someone like me. And this was before pattern recognition and pattern matching became super trendy. Obviously, there are phenomenal organizations out there that are making the business case for diversity. I was interested in turning pattern recognition on its head and saying, if we invest in what looks like us, if we invest in what's familiar, let's get more of us on the investing side, because we're probably going to be more open about investing in more of us on the startup side. And so since launching in 2011, we now have 300 members, so 300 sharks, um, who have invested over $5 million into over 50 portfolio companies. And I do want to note some depressing stats first, and then I'll give you some hope. Uh, according to Center for Venture Research, out of um, all US angels, only 20 something percent are women and only five something percent are minorities. Obviously not leaving space for those of us with more than one identity, such as women of color or femmes of color. Um, Contrasted to Project Diane a few years ago came out with a report of how much funding goes to black women founders, 0.2% not even 2%, 0.2%. And just recently there was an other, um, article that said out of like all venture funding, 2% goes to, and I'm putting in quotations, women founders. So just to get a sense, 98% of funding is going to guys. And um, in contrast of those 50, Portfolio, 50 plus portfolio companies and shout out their solstice um, here, one of our Pipeline Angels portfolio companies, over 20% have a black woman founder, over 12% have a Latina founder, over 26% have an LGBTQ founder, and interestingly enough also over 44% have a founder 40 years and older because ageism and age discrimination is also an issue. So I'm excited to be here. There's a lot of glitches and look forward to talking about them. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. My name is Heidi Swartz, and I lead the employment law team in-house at Facebook, um, which means I do a lot of um, work around everything to do with employment. Um, one of the things that I'm lucky enough to get to do is advise on our diversity programs um, and work also proactively to try to um, get at some of the issues that we're going to talk, talk about today. Um, I'm super excited to be on the panel with these folks and to represent sort of the company, the company point of view. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Reshma Sajani. I'm the CEO and founder of Girls Who Code. Um, before I talk about tech, I, I do want to recognize uh, that there are a lot of um, our people in our family that are Muslim and from marginalized communities that are really hurting today mm -hmm. um, and in pain and in fear because of the SCOTUS decision that came out earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, and I know they're heavy in our hearts, and so I wanted to just give a, give a moment to that. Um, I spent my life teaching girls how to computer program. 
Um, essentially, in the 1980s, let almost 40% of, of those in the computer science field were women, and today that number is less than 18%. And that's happening at a time where women are the majority in college, the majority in the labor force, and almost 42% of America's breadwinners. And you know what I have learned, uh, in 2012, we taught 20 girls how to code. Um, now we've reached 90,000, and we're going to reach several hundred thousand next year. And so what I've learned is that don't ever let anyone tell you that a problem isn't solvable, because it is. And this is one that we can actually solve in our lifetimes, and so we should. And so much of this conversation is centered around power, right? Technology has disrupted everything about the way that we live and work. And we're trying to get those who don't have access or power to it, women, people of color, the opportunity to help shape technology. And I think today we're going to talk a lot about what are the challenges, the obstacles, and the opportunities in making that a reality. And I want to talk mostly about the environment, the culture, the obstacles, and sort of how we get beyond where we are today. But I do think it's important to do a little bit of level setting for the group. Um, there's been a fair amount of attention to issues of women in tech, diversity in tech for a couple of years now. Companies have been reporting the numbers, which, you know, there's this, the old saying, you can't solve what you can't measure. We've been measuring it. We haven't solved it. Um, the numbers actually you know, showing slight gains across the industry at the big companies for women, almost no gains for underrepresented minorities, including women of color. Um, why are we where we are? And what hasn't worked in the last few years? Um, is it all pipeline? Is it, you know, obviously the first classes that you've been teaching, Reshma, won't necessarily graduate college to, to fill, that, fill that for a while, but it's not like there aren't um, women of color women in general, people of color in general, looking to be in the tech field. So why are we where we are at this very moment? You want me to start? I can start. Well, listen, it's not a pipeline problem, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we can just move on from that <laughs> yeah. and, and stop, stop using that as an excuse, because that's what it is. Um, you know, Girls Who Code on its own has taught 90,000 girls. We have 10,000 new college graduates that are graduating in computer science every, now, you know, last year. So I often now, get emails from girls saying, I'm at MIT, I'm at Berkeley, I'm at CUNY, I have a 4.0, a 3.8, I'm the head of my women in computing group, I just applied to X company, won't say the name, and I didn't get an offer. And then I make a list, and I write their name down, and I send off emails why. So first of all, when Rashma Sajani starts making a list, it's bad for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have to start making a list, mm -hmm. and try to really understand What's happening? And I think part of what's happening is there's real bias in the interview process. We started talking about that today. I will not name his name, but I was talking to a very nice man yesterday at my book signing who is the head of a quantitative hedge fund. And he was proudly saying that he hired five women for his internship class. I was, that's amazing. Where do they go to school? MIT, Berkeley, Stanford. Great. What's keeping you from five to 50? And he said, well, you know, some of the candidates that we get, you know, they go to schools that I'm not too sure about their technical skills. Or we just didn't really like the way that they dressed. We weren't really happy about how they communicated. Now, this lovely man who we would all, progressive, he's at Aspen Ideas, he was with his amazing partner, we probably would go have a coffee with him and think he was great. He didn't think that he was saying anything that was wrong. He didn't recognize the bias in that statement. And so there is nothing, nothing that is standing in between any of these companies getting from 13% to 30% to 40% to 50% besides their own bias in the hiring process. And so I think we just have to be really honest about that. And then we need to now start focusing on, stop talking about it as a pipeline problem and start trying to understand what is standing in the way between that and 40%. Because there are plenty of women and girls now that are raising their hand saying, hire me. So and Heidi, is there nothing standing, and then Natalia, I'll let you jump in, but it, uh, I want to put you on the spot. Is there, is there nothing standing between you and more gender parity and, and better diversity numbers? I mean, I think the problem is that there's a whole, there's a, a number of complex things that go into bias. A lot of the bias that we're talking about is unconscious bias. Um, and we recognize that. We, we you know, at Facebook, we have trainings um, that we've actually shipped out 
publicly so that other companies can use them to try to help people identify their own biases. And the men that are hiring have biases. The women, it turns out, have mm -hmm. biases too. Cheryl's talked a lot about that. Yeah, yep. so um, we're working on trying to identify those biases and help fix them. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day um, who works for a different big tech co company than me, and he was telling me that he interviewed a man and um, when the group got together that had interviewed him, they were kind of sharing notes. And he had shared three different times where he had had difficulties in his work at his current company. And my friend recognized that all three had to do with women. They were all bad interactions with women. And he's, he said, you know what? We just have to scrap this guy. We can't take him. And I think that's one of the other problems is it's not just hiring women and making sure we bring in women. We have to make sure that the men that are there and the companies are supporting the women um, and, and are spotting issues like this issue mm -hmm. and making sure, okay, maybe that's, not a good, maybe that's not a good candidate for us if we're trying to have a culture that's really supportive of women. Well, uh, what I was going to add is that we're talking here about instances. And if we really want to create an inclusive culture, we need to talk about the process and the systems. And another part is we need to share mistakes publicly. I'll, I'll start. I have one. Um, I'll call it one. Of, I, I'm ca currently calling it my current favorite DNI mistake: diversity and inclusion. So I spoke at the Tech Inclusion Conference about a year ago, and uh, I was on a panel. And then Emily Ladau, she's um, white, disabled, and a disability activist um, and a woman. And she talked about how um, disability often gets left out of conversation when we're talking about um, diversity and and tech. And then she asked the panel, how many of you have disabled people on your team? At the time, I knew that they, I had some of my team members who have neurotypicalities. So I knew that, OK, there was some, um, some uh, representation there. And then I thought to myself, who else is missing from the room? You know, who else could we, could we bring on? And we had a paid part-time position. And so I shared across uh, social media. And I, I, I'm hopeful the lawyer will approve with the language I included. <laughs> I said, um, we have this paid part-time opportunity. We encourage um, people of color who are deaf and hard of hearing to apply. Of course, who are the most people who applied? White, deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and ended up uh, connecting with um, a queer, native, deaf, black, femme, um, whose gender pronouns are she, her, and they, them, Anissa Flowers, who next month, it will be a year since she joined Pipeline Angels. And um, when she, uh, maybe a month or so ago, we're a remote team. I'm based in New York City. She's based in San Diego. We have people in San Francisco. We had our first Pipeline Angels team dinner in person. Um, it was in the Bay Area. We made sure that it was a woman-owned restaurant, Serpentine, in case you're wondering. It was sustainable. <laughs> it was organic. I found the one black woman ASL interpreter. Guess what? They're almost non-existent. Talk about black unicorn, because most of the ASL interpreters out there tend to be white women. And I'm like so excited. And so then after dinner, I ask, I, I ask Anissa, how, how did it go? And she was like, well, that restaurant was not deaf friendly. <laughs> um, it was dim lighting, which made it difficult for signing and to lip read. We weren't uh, on a round table, which makes it easier to communicate. And I was so disappointed. And um, I then ended up sharing the story when I was interviewing um, Ellen Powell on her book, Reset, which uh, for if many of you might not know, Ellen Powell sued um, Kleiner Perkins in 2012 um, for gender discrimination. She was you know, part of hashtag me too. Should have been on the cover of Time. Um, and um, and so I was telling her, this is my best mistake currently. And what do you think? You know? And she's like, Natalia, she told you. You've created a culture of Pipeline Angels where she felt comfortable letting you know that it wasn't a deaf-friendly restaurant. And so that's, in some ways, if we think about it, it's, and you will like this, Rashma, it's about being brave, not perfect. You know? mm -hmm. And as Maya Angelou says, now that I know better, I do better. Guess, guess what I'm thinking about now, the next time that we're making reservations for a restaurant. But if she had not been in the room, mm -hmm. if a deaf person had not been part of our team, I wouldn't know this. And so I, I'd pause it to all of you. Um, and I wanted to share this anecdote from um, The Loudest Duck, which is a book written by Laura Liswood, I believe a queer white woman. 
And she talks about how there's this room where there's a mouse and there's an elephant, and that the mouse knows everything about the elephant, where the elephant goes to the bathroom, where the elephant goes to sleep, where, you know, when it eats, etc., uh, because its survival depends on knowing everything about the elephant. Now, the elephant, the elephant doesn't even know that there's a mouse in the room. So I'd encourage you to think about where, in which rooms are you the mouse? In which rooms are you the elephant? I am, you know, I'm, I'm queer, um, Latinx, and a woman in a world where the default is straight, white, and a man. I'm also cis. I'm also hearing in a world where the default is cis and hearing. So where are you? Um, the mouse, where are you, the elephant? And in those rooms where you're the elephant, who's missing from those rooms? And who could you actually help bring in? Um, I'm curious if uh, Natalia's discussion made either of you think about a recent good mistake that you've made. I love how you qualified a good mistake, because mm -hmm. it'll make it easier for them to share, right? I can't think of a specific thing off the top of my head, but I do really like your point about um, creating the culture where uh, somebody feels comfortable bringing the issue forward. I, you know, that's something that I think one of the questions in our sort of our description of our panel was, how do we do this? How do we get rid of the monoculture? And I think the answer, or one of the answers, is invite people to tell you when you're screwing up. Don't just bring in diverse groups into your company, but actually invite them to call you on your mistakes. And one of the biggest mistakes I think people do is they create a diversity team. And this is, this is the experience of our diversity team. They create a diversity team, and then everyone looks at the diversity team and says, OK, why don't we have more diversity? And the diversity team is, you know, we're not doing the hiring. Um, we're here to help sort of hold up a mirror and help you guys do better. Mm. But you guys are making the decisions day to day. You need to give permission to people on your teams to raise their voice and tell you when you're screwing up, to tell you, you know, to help you hire. And to do, that's not the job. The diversity team isn't making those hiring decisions. And isn't, it can't be in all places of the company to call the company when you know, managers make those kinds of errors. Yeah, I mean, I, I make mistakes all the time, so I will not take the entire time as panel. But I mean, I think the thing <laughs> is, is that, look, I also think that for those of us that are in the feminist movement and in women's spaces, like we have to sit and recognize our privilege too. You know, and I push us at Girls of Code to always think about, you know what I mean, how are we, also have marginalized communities within our workplace, right, within who we serve, and how are we constantly using our platform to, to, to elevate them? I mean, I, you know, at Girls of Crow, when I started it, I had decided very early on, you know, most of the time when you're running a nonprofit, they make you pick. Either you're gonna be agnostic towards socioeconomic status and race, um, or you're gonna be intentional about it. And I really wanted to build classrooms that were, look like American classrooms should look like. So you had people who were black, Latina, trans, cis, Muslim, and that part of that building of sisterhood would actually help us build better products. And you know, every day I, let, I don't let in South Asian girls who look like me in my program for girls who look like Natalia. And, and, and I get some backlash from my community, you know what I mean, for that. But I think it's very, very important to always think about what is our unearned privilege? You know what I mean? And what is the opportunity for us to use our power and our platforms to elevate others? And I think this is the struggle that Silicon Valley is having. What is the hardest to change about the Valley is they truly believe that they're meritocratic. They truly believe that they are libertarian. And so they don't think that there's anything to fix, that if you just have the best code, then the best people will get elevated and hired. And that's just simply not true. And so part of it is just, you know, uncracking that myth that they have about themselves um, and shattering it. And I wanted to talk about intentionality, yeah. and I'm glad you brought up the example. And, you know, I think you've gone at it, and you've had the success because you've made it a goal. Um, and I'm curious, um, especially for you, Heidi, but also I, I want your thoughts on, on how big companies can do better, but talk about the role for... Um, goals, the role for quotas, the role for um, making sure you have diverse slates when you're interviewing people. Um, and then I want to move pretty quickly from hiring into the broader cultural issues because I think you can't look at this and only look at hiring. But I do want to look at um, what, what's working, what's not working for you, and what 
what you talked about, sort of the legal limits, and Natalia, you brought up a great example. You know, you can certainly say, um, you know, uh, deaf and hard of hearing women of color are encouraged to apply, and correct, you can say that. You can't say, we don't have any uh, deaf people on, my, on this team, we don't have any uh, women of color on this team, the next hire needs to be a woman of color. That's exactly um, right. But there's a whole lot of space between those two things. Right. So, I mean, this is, the, this is sort of the eternal struggle between the legal team and the diversity team at every company. Um, the diversity team and this, the leaders who want to improve diversity would love to just say, okay, the next you know, 500 hires, all women. Um, but you can't do that. I mean, the, the laws that pr protect women and minorities from uh, discrimination also protect uh, men from discrimination. Uh, so you can't make hiring decisions based on race. You can't make hiring decisions based on religion or based on sexual orientation in either direction. And I know it's kind of counterintuitive because if you're looking to create a diverse workforce, you know, you're, you're going to, to some extent, want to factor in the diversity that that person's bringing. And that's okay. But once you start setting goals for somebody and they're going to shut down candidates just because of their gender, I'm, there, we have really well-intentioned managers who, who ask all the time, why can't, I have 20 hires, why can't I just say 10 have to be women? And when we hi finish hiring men, I want to just make sure I reserve 10 spots for women. And that means you're rejecting male candidates without even looking to see if they're qualified and even considering them. But you and this can is where do, I, I, yeah. I'm very happy to push back here. <laughs> um, and this is something that we had the conversation because it's about reframing. I'm going to get provocative. So, you know, I often ask, how many of you are tired? Rushmore already says it's not a pipeline issue. However, I'm going to ask each of you, how many of you are tired to hear that it's a pipeline issue? That's a pipeline problem. So I have started saying it's a pipeline problem only if we talk about that it's clogged by mediocre white men. Um, I'm going to give you a beat so that you can like <laughs> process that. Um, it's reframing. You know, we so far have been talking about who's not in the pipeline, right? Like it's the focus, let's get more women non-binary people, men of color in the pipeline. We're not talking about who's already there. And so oftentimes in these quote unquote diversity conversations, they're almost always couched with, yes, we're getting more diversity in the room without lowering the bar. You know, there's always that like clause without lowering the bar because we, would, we don't want to be called out on that. And in some ways I, I push back and say, by getting more diversity in the room, we're actually raising the bar, right? Because we're actually being able to um, select from a broader, more diverse uh, range of, of options. And so when you, know, you mention that, I think that the, the concern I have is because we're talking about that the, mer the, the status quo is already Ha, qual, like has qual, is qualified, right? But like there might be some people there that are not qualified, um, and and so just just bringing that up, and um, I just the other thing that came to me when you were talking about that is like years ago, um, I read a, a a blog post about this big company that had decided to do the summer internship, and they realized that ninety percent of the summer hires were all you guessed it white guys, and they're like, what can we do? What can we do? And so the next summer, what they ended up doing, I used your example of like the ten regular, the ten regular spots that they had had the same, so they changed, they didn't change the numbers, ten regular. Um, they gave you know funding from the you know the department budget, and then there were 10, it's almost extra credit. There was an opportunity to have 10 extra interns um, and um, the, the department would have to pay from their own budget if they were um, white guys and if they were um, women, non-binary people, or men of color. I'm sh this was like years ago, so and it was pretty like binary, so I'm, I'm giving them the extra credit for saying that they were thinking about non-binary people. Um, then it would almost be like a scholarship, like it would come from like the big, big budget, right? And so in comes the 11th candidate, the person goes and says, I wanna hire this person. And there's like, great, you can pay for them. And they're like, what, what? And then just a reminder, the 10, we would pay for them, but you know, if you want an 11th um, person who's this demographic, then don't. The person the next day went back even more excited with like this resume saying, I'm gonna hire this person. It has so happened to be a woman. And so the person was like, where was this resume yesterday? Oh, it was in the stack on my desk. But it was easier to go to like 
the, the context, the, the pattern, than to do that extra work and find someone who is just as qualified, if not more, and the incentive, which is something I know, Ina, you're interested in us having the conversation, the incentive of um, not having to pay for it from one's own budget created the, the change. Can I, can I add to that, too? I mean, I think the thing that also think about is, um, and I think what, what, what Natalia is talking about is that when you use, when we use the word like qualified, it, it's dangerous because we know that we're not living, you know, in a world where we all have the same definition of what actually qualified means, right. um, especially when we're talking about recruiting. I know tons of girls that got into MIT or got into uh, Stanford that can't go because we're in a student loan crisis. We're not offering enough financial aid. And so they're having to pick schools where most of these companies are just not even looking at. And so we know that we're in a unique situation right now where we're, we're actually not creating an opportunity for us to even look, you know what I mean, for us to really have a, 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 a meritocratic definition of what qualified is. And so we know that that really needs to change. I think the second thing, so to, um, Natalia and I actually did an NPR interview this morning um, with uh, a six-year-old girl, Amanda Southworth, who uh, is, is running her own company. And um, you know, she said two things to me that I, the one was very interesting and, and, and really important to, I think, process. One, even at 16, she is very sensitive to not being uh, looked at as being only in the room because she is a woman, right. right? This idea of like we immediately assume when we're in spaces where we are the only one that we are being we are there because of our gender, our race, et cetera. And so we have to, I think that we have to actually push back and I don't care if qualified men can't get in the door anymore. I just don't, you know? And I think that we just, you know, that's it. Like we need to move on from that conversation because unqualified men have been getting jobs forever. You know what I mean? And qualified women have get, been had the door shut on their faces forever. We are in a different era. We are not going back, and that, in, that includes how we are defining what qualified means. And I think we need to do it, if not for ourselves, for, for girls like Amanda. I think the second thing that is different about technology than any other industry is there is a danger in having technology teams that are uniform, that are only white, male, and Asian. And I think Amanda brought up the best example of that. Mm. She was saying that she'd read an article that you know, oftentimes Google Home and Alexa is being used by men who are, um, who are uh, engaged in domestic abuse against their partners to lock their partners out of their homes, or secondly, to turn on loud music to actually harass them. So what's interesting is that so many devices and products are being used that are being built by men against women, and these men didn't even think about it because they've never been in, face, in situations where they had to feel like their safety was even being threatened, whereas we as women face that every single day when we walk out that door. So I think it is even more important for us to think as attorneys, right, how do you get around some of these rules to actually have quotas, benchmarks, and goals that we can hold these companies accountable to because if we don't, we are gonna create products, you know what I mean, that are, that are hurtful to women and to people of color. And secondly, we can't, we can't depend on AI and robots to actually make things better and to take bias out of it because they represent our collective intelligence. And so all of the data sets that have already been created represent that collective bias already. And so we are left in a really, 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 really challenging quandary where I just think that we have to think about how do we, especially in technology, you know what I mean, uh, overcome some of the genuine legal barriers that might be there to reaching, I think, what we all really want to achieve. There are some, I mean, we've gotten creative, mm -hmm. I'll say that. <laughs> and we're willing to take some risks on it. Um, we have a diverse slate approach, which is also called the Rooney Rule. Um, and for most of our open heads, we have a rule that you can't start really interviewing, you can't make a hiring decision until you've got a slate that represent, that you, where you have at least one candidate, and in some cases, at least two candidates um, that reflect the diversity needed on that team. Um, so for example, in the legal department, we're, we are at 50-50 parity for men and women, so a woman on your panel wouldn't count for diverse slate, but a black lawyer or a Latina lawyer would count. Um, so that's something that some, some lawyers would tell you, oh, you can't even I do mean, that. Sorry. I'm not actually, hashtag not, not sorry. Um, Demi Lobato, I love you. Um, 
a white, a white woman wouldn't be counted on that panel. I'm, I'm just correct. making that qualification because one of the reasons is that we often talk about women in tech. And what we don't talk about is that we're actually referring to white women in tech. And so hashtag language matters. And so we need to actually, yes, women would count. It just so happens to be that they should be women of color. Right. And in this example, in the legal department, a white woman or an Asian woman wouldn't count. A Latina woman, yeah. a black woman, or a Latino man or a black man would count. Um, so in that, in that example. Um, we also do, we don't have hiring goals. We don't have um, that, but we do track our progress. We do measure it and we do hold the most senior leaders accountable. Um, the danger for a lawyer is you don't want to tell somebody you have to hire this many women and hit this goal because then for every white man that's not hired, they're going to say, I wasn't hired because you, goal, you had a goal and you had to meet that goal. So you hired this Latina woman instead of me. Can and I, that's can I ask you a question? Can yes. I, I want to ask you a question. Something that I've heard after um, the James Damore wonderful memo is that what many technology companies are saying, their biggest litigation risk is actually from class action suits by white men. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in Silicon Valley, from what I heard, right. is that a lot of the lawsuits that are happening are white men claiming that they're being discriminated against. So suddenly there's a population of white men who feel like they are the minority in technology, which is fascinating. So is some of that coming from a fear in terms of what the current litigation climate is in some of these in these technology companies? I think it is. I mean, I, being so sued. I think that that's important yeah. to, and who's to like being, let that I, sink in I, Who's for being a sued and how are they defending I, it? And so bef before okay. that, I did want to provide some context with this because we were talking about solutions, right? And we also, as in like, that's something that we want to talk. So I'm going to be provocative once again, surprise. So is it that women, non-binary people and men of color just need to get better at um, suing? Th yeah. yeah. You well, know, that's going to be you know, where like, I was going. You know, because if, if the threat is from yeah. white men right now, we know that um, that same thing that you're saying, hey, I didn't get hired because of this or because of that or because of that, a lot of marginalized communities, they're not getting fired because of this, because of that, and because of that. Maybe. I mean, look, there's one big high-profile lawsuit right now, and it's against Google, brought by James Damore, mm -hmm. saying that he was discriminated against because he's a white male conservative. Um, that's, that's the one I know about. I mean, there may be others out there. Um, I think but there's, there's all these other suits, right. uh, all these other gender discrimination suits out there, all these right. suits by women. There's no question that women, people of color, particularly women of color, are super upper, underrepresented at these companies. Mm -hmm. So how is it we've gotten to a place where companies are so afraid of the white men suing mm -hmm. and not more afraid of all the others? I don't think they are that afraid of the white men suing. I mean, well, you I just can't said speak... we can't set goals. No, no, no. We, we don't want to violate the law. And by squarely violating the law, you put the company at legal risk. You don't want to lose the lawsuit, but you're not afraid of defending it. There's a difference. But you're afraid of setting goals. Mm. Setting goals and setting quotas creates a, an issue. For if you tell a hiring manager you have to hire five women, that seems like a wonderful way to work at the problem. But they may not necessarily hire. I mean, you, Reshma, you pointed out earlier, yeah. you, what you don't want is a woman in the room feeling like I'm only here because I'm a woman. If they're hired against No, women, I, I'm saying no, I don't. No. I didn't say that. No. I actually am. We I, should be happy. Yes. <laughs> That's what I said. I said that it's sad. Right, yeah. that 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 we're now also creating this young generation who immediately feel that they have to justify their presence yeah. because of that narrative, which is absolutely false. Because yeah. I actually think that every time in the room, we have to fight ten times harder to be in the room. What I tell people when they're like, "Oh my gosh, am I in this room because I'm a woman or because I'm queer or like all of the above?" I'm like, just imagine how many rooms you're not in, or you haven't been invited in because you are a woman or queer or all of the above. But, so. but I think going back to this point, and I do think you're, I think what you're saying is important is, is the fact that like, because I do think that there is a narrative that white men in the valley feel threatened and they're using litigation or they will continue to use litigation as a way to exercise that threat. And that it becomes harder than for HR departments to do anything, you know, or they may feel like it's harder for them to do anything that might seem, you know what I mean, a risk to providing some evidence, right, for the fact that there is some bias. And I think that that's what sucks, right, is that um, we're, we're in this situation where, uh, and I think we have to figure out as, as women, as people of color, how to fight back, right? And like how can, com how can technology companies who have a lot of resources say F it, 
You know what I mean? Like we're going to set some, again, real goals, even though there is a litigation threat, because no one gives up power easily. So I think we could talk a bunch more about this topic. Right. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sensitive on time. I do want to get to audience mm -hmm. questions. There's one more topic that we talked about wanting to hit, and that is, you know, it's not just about hiring. It's what is the environment like right. at these companies for women, for people of color? So many, so many. If if it was actually about the new hires, the industry would actually be doing much better than it is. The new hires are being offset by all the women, all the people of color, all the trans people, all the non-binary people who are hired at one point and then leave for one reason or another. And I'm curious um, where culture and where Me Too plays into this. Um, it strikes me that the environment, once uh, women and people of color get hired in to the companies, is still not where it needs to be. Um, and I'm curious how much each of you sees that as an issue. And then I do want to get to Yeah, well, I, wanna, I was wondering, how many of you got a chance to check out the reveal um, report article that came out this week? So, okay, spo spoilers, the numbers are worse or like slightly better. Um, it's, what was interesting is that, uh, particularly when it comes to women in tech, it was saying that white women, even though the percentages were low, they remained steady when we talk about retention. What happened specifically, and they highlighted black women and, and Latinas, and yes, black women can be Latinas, just representing, mm -hmm. um, is that um, they would, not only did they start off low, they got lower in terms of retention. And so just acknowledging that piece, the, it ha also had a very visual um, metaphor that I, I loved in terms of how like analogies, and it was sucky in terms of what it represents. And it said that like if we thought about you know climbing the ladder, that the staircase for white men widens as they go senior, you know, they get senior, they go higher up. And for women of color specifically, um, black and Latinas, it narrows. So just think about, just even visually, like as you're, as you're going, you know, becoming more senior, the, the, the staircase is narrowing. And so what I just, um, you know, something that I'm very passionate about is talking about retention. Because it's not just about the, you know, how many people you're getting into the pipeline, it's how many stay. And specifically, as Marion Wright Edelman says, you can't be what you can't see. And so something that I noticed was really powerful at Pipeline Angels is that the, the more um, women of color and femmes of color members, so those sharks that I was telling you, and I call them sharks in training while they're going through the boot camp, um, we, had, we had an increase in applications from women of color entrepreneurs and femmes of color founders. And so the two reasons for that is that, number one, they saw themselves reflected back on the other side of the table. So they knew that, you know, they they are seen, and I'm using the word seen on purpose, it might be ableist, I'm acknowledging that, because right now we are at a time that so many of us are literally being erased. And I'm using that word on purpose, we are being erased. And um, the second reason is, if you think about each woman of color, femme of color, that is now Pipeline Angels member, is a shark in training, has, become, has earned their wings, had, has made their first angel investment, they're also bringing their own communities. They're serving as hubs. And for a lot of these women of color, femmes of color, they might be the first angel in their community, in their network, and they're probably our founders and entrepreneurs who, especially like um, with scalable businesses, that hadn't ever met one, you know, didn't even know that they existed. So just thinking about the ripple effect is important. And so making sure that we are focusing on the retention, because guess what? That's going to solve the recruitment a lot faster. Um, really quick, and then I do want to get <laughs> to questions. And I apologize. No, for you go ahead. So um, Natalia made one, one point that I really um, I like in terms of culture, which is it does help one. if you could. No, you made a yes, lot of great ones. But in terms of inside of a company, if you can see leaders that look like you and that you can relate to, obviously you're more likely to stay because you see a, a path forward for you. Um, what, nobody's there yet, right? So I think one of the things that we have to do, um, particularly in tech, is we have to engage the, the white men um, and we have to make allies out of them. And I, I do believe that, I mean, I've seen it myself, we have such, um, so many allies, so many white men in tech companies that really wanna see changes as well. And really, they don't know how to help necessarily, um, but they want to and they're good intentioned. So 
I think trying to tap into that and, and work with them, trying to help them understand what biases they're approaching their hiring with so that they can address those, having them be comfortable mentoring. And that was one thing we talked about. Um, there's all this talk that the Me Too movement may create a backlash where men are no longer comfortable mentoring women, um, that it might be seen as something nefarious or that they might be engaging in inappropriate conduct. That drives me nuts. If you have a good trust relationship with a woman that works for you, don't worry that she's going to make a false accusation of harassment against you. Mentor her. You'll be better at your job, too. Because as we all know, the business case for diversity, if you have more diverse perspectives, you're going to create a better product. So if you have a mentor that's, or a mentee that's different than you, you're going to learn that person's perspective, and you're going to actually be a better performer, too. So I think trying to engage everybody at the company, not just you know putting a tax on the senior mm -hmm. women leaders or the senior black leaders or the senior Latina leaders to step up and try to mentor and bring people along, but the white leaders and the Asian leaders and every you know everybody there that's willing to, to, to do that, to engage and work on uh, making sure the culture is inclusive. Yeah, I mean, I think just to build on that that point that Heidi made that is, is so important is yeah, that really pisses me off too, right? When it's all like, I can't, you know. But I think that there are a lot of, and Toronto made this point yesterday in our panel, and we talked about it this morning, is that there are a lot of wonderful men in our lives. Toronto Burke, the founder of Me Too. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Natalia. There are a lot of wonderful men in our lives who are sitting in a room and hear a rape joke or hear something said that's inappropriate, and they don't say anything. And until that changes, right, until we get our male allies, you know, to actually speak up and have the courage to speak up to, like nothing is really going to change. And so I think really do thinking about how do we create a culture that fosters that um, is really important. OK. Um, so I promised I'd leave some time. I know a lot of you have questions. Um, all I'd ask is please say who you are and keep the question really short and make sure it's a question so we can get to as many as possible. I saw your hand first and then uh, in the front row, or the second row. And let's try to get people of color as well. Thank you for this conversation. My name's Kim. I work in HR, in tech, in a big company. Um, I think we do, we're doing a better job, we're making a little bit more progress in hiring at the junior levels in a more diverse way. Mm -hmm. But we also do all the things like um, employee resource groups and um, male mentors. It's not having an impact in promotion of mm -hmm. diverse candidates. Mm -hmm. So what practical recommendations do you have for us getting better at growing our diverse talent. We're retaining them reasonably well, but actually growing diverse talent so that the candidates and the women or other diverse people at various levels are seeing themselves eventually. Yeah. In the Thanks. So, so how do we promote? A, so there's a study that actually talks about, and I'm using this, I, I would otherwise have said white women and people of color. However, the way that the study breaks it down is women and men of color. So I'm acknowledging it, hashtag language matters, that women and men of color are actually penalized when promoting um, diversity. And so um, Women, when they're promoting diversity, are viewed, and, and, and let's acknowledge that, that that's also what we're using in terms of diversity, means like we're using it to mean women, non-binding people, and men of color, that also is heavy duty, right? Like, and um, they're viewed as colder. Men of color, when they're fostering diversity at work, are viewed as less competent. There's one demographic that actually benefits from uh, promoting diversity. Guess what demographic? White men. White men are viewed as more benevolent. And so to your point, I'd say there is a business case for getting the white men to leverage their white male privilege to get more people in the room. And then the second thing that you were saying, um, I forgot, so I'll come back. <laughs> um, um, I want to see other hands to, to Natalia's point of making sure we get uh, a more diverse slate of questioners. If everyone who has a question, puts up your hand, then we can get a sense of how many questions. So right now, I'm only seeing one, oh, there's one there. there, and one in the back, and one in front. We'll try and get to all three. Um, I'm a high schooler, and I was wondering, what type of systems can we implement like in high schools to correct this cultural glitch, rather than just starting in a workplace? That's a great question. I like that, Reshma. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I did a TED talk on this idea about raising girls to be to be brave, not perfect, and I have a book coming out in February. And it really, you know, we have to change the structures, we have to change the systems, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of racism, cultural, and bias. But we also have to figure out how do we stop 
silencing ourselves. You know, from a young age, we're taught to be polite and to not raise our voice and, you know, not get our dress dirty. And so when things happen to us, you know what I mean? When we are treated with bias and when it goes as far as sexual assault and sexual discrimination, we're not able to stand up. And so, you know, I'm on a mission to really figure out how do we teach kind of everyday bravery. And again, listening to Amanda this morning was so powerful, right? And that here was a girl, and she was saying, you know, I'm 16 years old, I run a company, you know what I mean? And I artificially make my voice sound deeper so I can be taken seriously. Every woman in this room has done something to the way we look, the way we dress, the way we talk, to make ourselves feel smarter and to be, be, have self-worth, you know, and, and that's, it's got to end, right? And I, I think that, and again, it was, we talked a lot about this with Toronto on the panel this morning, is both of our programs at Girls Who Code and the work that, that she does on her initiative is about teaching girls at a very young age, you know what I mean, their own self-confidence, their own self-worth, you know, owning their own place in the world. And if you can teach that as young as your age, you are going to be just fine. So we only have two minutes, and then there's two more questions. So if you can make them really quick, and we'll try and uh, make our answers as quick as possible. Thanks. Oh, mine was very similar to that. I'm a mom of young girls, so I'm going to pass it on. Great. Yes, Great. people of color, people of color, people of color. Or should I say person of color? And then the white guy gets it, really. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else that? Pass the privilege, pass the privilege. Me, oh, I know that there's a woman of color right there, Latina, Colombiana, no, Dominicana. No, Mexicana. <laughs> So to Reshma's point about not being like super polite all the time, I just have to speak up and say a good mistake, I think, but we can't look at people and assume that they might not be a person of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I wanna thank everyone for um, being an active part of the conversation, whether you were listening, whether you were on stage. Um, clearly there's so much more uh, that we could have gotten to. Um, I think the important part is to really um, start having these difficult conversations within your organizations, within your companies. You know, it's hard to be vulnerable. I appreciate everyone on the panel for being vulnerable, you guys for choosing to show up, but there needs to be way more people having this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so the next time one of the other uh, leaders at your company, and I'd encourage you all to think of yourselves as leaders, uh, you know, talks about, you know, oh, we're trying to be more diverse, but we're not succeeding. Push them, why aren't we, you know, what's, what's the hardest part? What's standing in the way? How can we work on that? Um, uh, Reshma has a book coming out. Um, Natalia pointed to some great articles. Um, I do a daily newsletter uh, for Axios called Login. If you're interested in getting it every day, I try and hold the industry accountable on these issues, social justice issues, all kinds of things. Just go to getlogin.axios.com. Can I actually make a plug yeah. for Facebook? <laughs> Facebook also has an amazing resource page for, for parents and kids who are trying to get their kids coding programs. Uh, which tech prep, yeah, yeah which and, and also some share, hiring I, stuff. I did want to share that Pipeline Angels is heading to Puerto Rico this summer because we need to get Yay. more money to the island. Um, so let, um, let me pipelineangels.com. Let's get more money to the island, to the local economy, and to the Boricuan founders. And Facebook has also put in some of its hiring steps uh, to how to cast a more diverse slate, right? Right, we have a bunch of um, different resources online. We have our, our uh, bias training, our unconscious bias training available. We put our harassment policy online so people, com smaller companies could use it as a model so they don't have to pay lawyers to write a big, hard to understand policy. And we also have tips for how to train managers um, and big advocates. So, thank you, thanks to the panel. Thank you.